So we've, we've gone through the concepts of encryption. Some of the details that we mentioned yesterday uh, about all the different algorithms, you don't need to remember. What, what the key points that you should get out of this part so far is those concepts of encryption and some of the assumptions that we're going to make. So that with encryption, we take our plain text, we apply an algorithm, and we get ciphertext. And we're talking currently about symmetric key encryption. We take a key as an input to that algorithm, and the ciphertext is produced as output, and that same key is used to decrypt. And we arrived at a set of assumptions after going through a few examples, but I'll just jump through to the assumptions slide. And uh, using the notation, we encrypt using one key. If it's shared between A and B, we get ciphertext. When we decrypt using the same key, we'll, we assume we'll get the original plaintext. <coughs> and similar, if we decrypt using the incorrect key, we assume we'll get the wrong plaintext and that it will be recognizable to the person decrypting, that it's wrong. Okay, so someone gives me ciphertext, I don't know the key. I try a key, which is the wrong key. When I decrypt, we assume that the operation will produce something such that I can recognize that key didn't work. The plain text is wrong. That is, we'll be able to recognize the correct plain text. Let's look at that a little bit uh, and extend on, on the properties or, or particularly the services that this starts to provide. We have our user, user A. Let's say they want to send, to send some data across a network to user B. Let's go through some of the basic services symmetric key encryption provides. We want to send data. And A has some plain text. I'll denote it as what? P T. It's the plain text that A wants to transmit to B. Okay, I'll use a subscript T to say this is what we want to transmit because we'll distinguish about what's sent and what's received shortly. Before we send the plain text, if we want to provide the service of confidentiality, we want to keep this plain text confidential, we encrypt it. So we encrypt and we get some ciphertext, CT, and we apply some algorithm, some encryption algorithm, whether it's DES, triple DES, AES, or some other cipher. As an input, we use a key a key shared between A and B, it's an A, and we take the plain text as input. So this is the operation performed at A. We encrypt our plain text and we get ciphertext and now we send the ciphertext to B. So we can think A sends CT. And what does B receive? C. Let's denote what B receives as CR. Okay. Normally we'd think if I send a value CT across the network, then we'll receive exactly the same we'll receive CT. But later we'll look at, well, what if an attack occurs where someone tries to modify it? That's why I'll distinguish between what's transmitted and what's received. It may be that what's received is different from what's transmitted. But, so we'll distinguish between sending and receiving. B receives. What does B do when it receives the ciphertext? Decrypts. How? What key? The key shared between A and B. Okay, we're using symmetric key encryption, so to decrypt, we're going to try and decrypt this ciphertext, and to do so, we must use the key that's shared between A and B. In particular, the key which was used for encrypting. So, 
For this to work, we assume that B knows that key. So maybe we'll note that. Maybe I should have done it before, but uh, some sort of assumed knowledge was that A had a key beforehand, and so did B. It had the same value. You cannot see it. Okay, I'll change that next time. It's KAB. Uh, what are we doing? Decrypting. So we decrypt with KAB the receive ciphertext. And we assume that if something's encrypted with some key, Okay, PT was encrypted with some key to get the ciphertext. And if we decrypt with the same key, we'll get the original plain text out. But we'll denote it first as simply PR. So this is the plain text received by B. B decrypts CR using the key from it's shared with A because it knows the message came from A and gets some plain text PR. Let's consider some cases. First, the, the, the normal case. Uh, let's consider the case that CR equals CT. That means that there was nothing modified along the way. A transmitted some ciphertext, and the bits that were transmitted is what's received by B. So this is the normal case. We send the ciphertext and we receive it. What can we say about PR in that case? In particular, with respect to A and PT. What's true? If CR equals CT, what does PR equal? PT. Okay. Our assumption is that so CT and CR are the same. So CT, so we can almost we think of it, we remove the subscripts, take PT, encrypt with KAB, we get the ciphertext, decrypt that same ciphertext with the correct key, the same key, then we must get the original plain text. This is our uh, assumed property of encryption. If the two ciphertexts are the same, then that means that the received plain text equals PT, the transmitted, which is what we'd expect. So again, one of these assumptions that we're making is that encrypt with the rec correct key and then decrypt with the same key, you'll get the original input back, the plain text. Let's consider some other cases. What about the case if the received ciphertext, CR, was not equal to CT. Why? Even more than that. So in this case, why would I say that? CR is not equal to CT. Maybe we transmit something across a network, a sequence of bits, and somewhere along the way there's an error, or with respect to security, someone malicious modifies the message. We send a sequence of 64 bits and someone changes some of those bits. So what's received is different from what is transmitted. So follow through what happens. B receives CR, decrypts with KAB, and what do they get? PR, and correct, PR will not be the same as PT. Because similarly, if we use the wrong key, if we use the wrong ciphertext, we will not get the original plain text back. 
So that's an important property of our encryption. We encrypted PT to get CT. If we try to decrypt a different ciphertext using the same key, we will not get that original plaintext back. So the plaintext values will not be the same in this case. And what's more, we'll say PR is incorrect. And we assume that B will be able to know that. When they decrypt, they get some plain text PR. And really it's a random sequence of characters. If they convert it back to the, the message format that they think it was, say an English message, it doesn't make sense. So our assumption is that B will be able to detect and know that this is incorrect. Okay, so it's not just that it's not equal, but really they, they know it's not equal because they recognize that the received plain text is incorrect. If we decrypt something where we've used a, either a different key or a different ciphertext than what we used in the encryption, then the receiver will be able to detect that. So B knows this is incorrect. In fact, this leads to one of the services that we provide in security systems. The first one, remember we were providing confidentiality. The idea is that when A sends a message to B, no one else can read the message. How does that work? Why is P confidential? Why can no one know P, PT, PR? Why? You're the malicious user now. You've intercepted the ciphertext. What do you need to do? Let's draw you. Let's go back to the case one. You are the malicious user, Mal. You've intercepted the ciphertext. You want to learn the plain text. What do you need to do to learn the plain text? Or what do you need to know? You need to know the key, KAB, because if you know the ciphertext, similar to B knows the ciphertext, to get the plain text we must decrypt it. So in fact, we need to know the key to decrypt. And that comes back to one of our assumptions that is the key KAB is secret. The malicious user doesn't know it. If they did know it, it wouldn't be secret. So the malicious user, since they don't know the key, what can they do? How can they get the plain text? Try. What, what could you try? Brute force, so you could try different keys. All right, let's try. So our malicious user, consider they've received they've received the ciphertext, they've intercepted. So what they try to do is decrypt the ciphertext. Let's say CR. Actually, we can say just CT, assuming they're the same. What key do we decrypt with if we're the malicious user? Well, we can try all the keys. A brute force attack would be to try uh, different keys. So K, K1, and then we can try K2. for any value of k, and we get some plain text as output, let's call it p1. So what the malicious user does is takes the ciphertext, decrypts with some key, gets some plain text. What do they recognize when they get that plain text? Assuming k1 is not the same as kab, assuming that it's not the correct key, Again, we recognize that P1 is incorrect. 
That's one of our assumptions, that when we decrypt some ciphertext with the wrong key, K1 is wrong because it's not the same one that was used for encryption, then we'll get plain text that we'll recognize is incorrect. The malicious user will realize, ah, K1's not the right key. Let's try a different one. They'll try and decrypt with K2. They'll try a different value, the same ciphertext, and they'll get a plain text value, P2. And then again, they'll recognize P2 is not the correct key because the plain text is incorrect. So this is one of our assumptions that we can recognize that the plain text is incorrect. And a brute force attack is just keep trying with all the other keys. How do we stop a brute force attack? How do we stop it? How do we prevent our malicious user from being successful? Set the a limit? No. How do I? St I I'm A and B, or I, I know them, I, want, I don't want to allow the malicious user to do a brute force attack. All right? I don't want them to be successful, of course. A longer key, make the key long. Because again, the approach of the malicious user, try key one. Try some random key, or the key of all zeros, maybe. Doesn't work, try key two. Doesn't work, try key three. Okay? They need to try all possible keys in the worst case. So to prevent a brute force attack being successful, make sure that the number of keys that the malicious user has to try is very large. And we gave some numbers yesterday of what's very large. Usually uh, 128 bits is considered very large because it will require, uh, what, millions of years to do a brute force attack. So brute force is easy to prevent by making sure the key is large enough. Okay? such that it would just take too long to try all of them. If the malicious user was lucky or if they, uh, we had a short key, then they could try all and they would find the correct key if they keep going. But we assume, again, that we have a key which is large enough such that brute force won't work. So if the malicious user cannot find the key via brute force, what else can they do? How else can the malicious user find our plain text? Let's say the key is long enough that brute force will take forever. Anything they can try? Crypt analysis. So if the malicious user knows the algorithm they're using is some very weak algorithm, then they can maybe, given the ciphertext, work back and find the plain text or the key. So another assumption we'll make from now on is that the algorithms used for encryption and decryption are strong. That there are no weaknesses in them that the malicious user can take advantage of. Okay. And, and AES is an example which is considered a strong cipher. There are no known weaknesses which are practical to allow decryption without the key. So we will base everything from now on on those assumptions that the malicious user can't do a brute force attack and they can't find weaknesses in the algorithm. Therefore, if we've encrypted, they will not be able to decrypt. Any questions so far? What's that service that we just provided to our users, A and B? What's the name of the service? If you go back, we went through six services, and there'll be quiz questions about that for sure. What's one of the services that this provides? It's the normal one we think of when we talk, think about security, usually. What's the purpose of doing this encryption? Just for fun? <laughs> Conf to keep our data confidential. Okay, that's our purpose. So this is the service of confidentiality. When we encrypt our plain text, we send the ciphered hex across, and the malicious user cannot find the plain text. Therefore, it's kept confidential between A and B. So this is the service of confidentiality. 
What are some of the other services? So that's one thing. So it's easy to provide confidentiality, encrypt our data. But there are other things that we often want to provide in security systems. What are some other services? Go back to some of your first lecture notes on the introduction. There's a list of six services. Security services, the, the title of the slide is. Have a look at them. Read through those six services. So the third one on, is listed as data confidentiality. We can do that. Easy, encrypt. But what else would we like to do sometimes? Yeah. Authentication is another service. And there are two different aspects of authentication. We want to make sure, what the one we'll consider now is we want to make sure that the person sending us the message is who they say they are. And another important service is data integrity. I want to make sure that no one can modify the message along the way. If they do, I want to be able to detect that modification. So let's look at them and we'll see that this encryption can actually provide those services as well and see why. In fact, we just saw data integrity. Let's say the malicious user modified the cipher text that was transmitted such that CR, the received cipher text, was different from CT this case, what happens? If the ciphertext decrypted is different from what was in, obtained from encryption, then the plain text will not be the same and importantly B will recognize that the plain text obtained from decryption is incorrect. So this second case we said that the ciphertext was modified. So we're saying if the malicious users tried to change the message that was sent across the network, what would happen is B would receive CR. They know it comes from A, so they use KAB to decrypt. And because CR is different from CT, when we decrypt with that same key, KAB, the PR we obtain will be different from PT. That's the assumption of our cipher. If we encrypt two different values with the same key will get two different ciphertext values. And that concept applies here. If we encrypt PT with KAB, we get CT. If we encrypted PR with the same key and PR was different from PT, we'd get a different ciphertext. And the same applies backwards. So, if the malicious user modifies the ciphertext, then B will know that or they will at least know that it's not the correct ciphertext because when they decrypt, they'll find that PR is incorrect. So B recognizes, ah, I receive ciphertext. I decrypt it. I get plain text, which is incorrect. So don't trust this ciphertext. It may have been modified by someone along the way. It may be just a, a, an accidental error in the transmission but we know not to trust this ciphertext because it, it could have been modified. And that's how we provide data integrity, or one way of providing data integrity. Someone can modify the message, but we can easily detect that it has been modified, and therefore we ignore that. So we've provided the service of confidentiality and data integrity so far. Questions? How do we know that plain text is incorrect? How do we know the plain text is incorrect? Anyone? Anyone else from me? All right, that was one of our assumptions. Why? Uh, um, let's find an example, a simple example to, to illustrate the concept. Uh,
start with a simple example. It's Maybe hard to see. Remember we did an example of the Caesar cipher where we changed, we shift the letters by three positions or x positions. This will be hard to see, but I'll explain it. I've got some ciphertext. It actually goes along, you can't read it all, but it's, here's some ciphertext. And the cipher I used was the Caesar cipher, the very simple cipher of when we take plain text, we shift the plain text letters to the right by k positions. For example, if I have the, the letter A in plain text and k is 3, then the output ciphertext, I shift A three positions to the right, so A becomes B, C, D. A encrypts to become D, and so on. So this was ciphertext obtained using the Caesar cipher. It keeps going, and I use some key. It wasn't three. So, what I could do as a brute force at attack is to find the plain text, try all possible keys. And I did that. And I show them here. It's hard to see, but you'll eventually recognize. So, what I did is I took the cipher text, I decrypted if the key was A or zero. I tried that key. Then I tried key B or 1, and I got this plain text, and this plain text. Which one's the correct key? 11. Why? It's the only one that makes sense. Okay? And that's typical with uh, any encryption algorithm. If we encrypt using a particular key, some plain text, and we get ciphertext. If we decrypt that ciphertext with the wrong key, we will get plain text that doesn't make sense. And it's only in, with the one key we will we get plain text that makes sense. That is, all of these will be recognizably wrong. You can recognize that all the others are wrong. Right? This is a simple case. It's using English language. But in fact, any message we send, we can include, make sure it has some structure. That's the idea here. Why do you recognize 11 is correct? Because you see there's some structure there. There's some words that you know. With the others, there's no structure. It looks random. Even with non-English text, with images, videos, and so on, they all have some structure such that when we decrypt, if we use the wrong key, we will recognize that they don't have the structure that we expect. When we use the right key, we'll recognize that it does have the structure that we expect. So that's an example of why we know the plain text is correct or incorrect. Use the wrong key, we'll know it's incorrect. Use the correct key, we'll know it's correct. Okay. Well, if we, yes, we want to know the correct plain text. In this case, if we try all the keys, find the one that makes sense. I understand if mm. the my research is still modified the ciphertext. Mm. If I input the correct plain text, I input the correct key. Mm. So I get the correct Same concept applies. So this was the case. We have the ciphertext. We use the wrong key. We get recognizably wrong plain text. Okay? Cipher text, use key zero, we get random characters. The same concept applies if we have the wrong cipher text, but the correct key will get recognizably wrong plain text. I don't have an example of that, but if you change the cipher text and use the correct key, then you'll get wrong plain text. And with real ciphers today, that will be recognizably wrong plain text. So basically, if you decrypt with the wrong key or you decrypt the wrong cipher text, you will know that.
One of them is stated here. Decrypting with the wrong key will not produce the original plain text and the decryptor will be able to recognize that that key is wrong. And the other one is stated a little bit later. We'll get to that in a moment. Uh, assumptions somewhere. It's, it's part of... Well, it's, it's, it's captured in these assumptions that if we receive ciphertext that successfully decrypts, then we know that it has not been modified. Well, uh, that's based upon this concept. If it doesn't successfully decrypt, then we assume that it is the wrong key or the wrong ciphertext. Let's try and write them down, just to be clear. Let's come back to our... Maybe a point that's, that's missing, okay. With any cipher, we encrypt using some key, I'll just call it key, key one, plain text one, we get some cipher text, let's call it C1. The assumptions we have with the ciphers is if we use the same cipher, we encrypt with the same key but a different plain text, we'll get a cipher text if P1 is not the same as P2, then C1 will not be the same as C2. In other words, if we encrypt two different plain texts, we'll get two different cipher texts. P1 and P2 are different, therefore C1 and C2 are different. And in the reverse, if we decrypt two different cipher texts, we'll get two different plain text. Similar, if we use a different key on the same plain text, look at the first and the third case, if we encrypt the same plain text with different keys, we'll get different cipher text. That's the, the third case here. Different plain text, different cipher text, different key, different cipher text. And similar if we go backwards. If we have two different cipher text values, C1 and C2, if we decrypted them with the same key, we'd get two different plain text values. Or, if we have two different cipher text values, C1 and C3, if we decrypt them with different keys, well, that's not a good one. Uh, ignore that one. Different key, different cipher text. Different plain text, different cipher text. That's all. Correct. If we encrypt the same plain text with a different key, we'll get different cipher text. And if we encrypt different plain text with the same key, we'll get different cipher text. All right. Any further questions? Any questions? No. It's all easy? Not easy. What's not easy? Everything's not easy. Is there anything less easy than something else?
Anyone not understand these concepts? It's okay, but we need to make sure we understand them because everything is built upon these assumptions that we're, we're making as we go. Different plaintext, different ciphertext. Different key, different ciphertext. So, given that, what do we get to? Coming back, malicious user modifies the ciphertext transmitted so that CR is different to CT. So, when B decrypts CR, they're going to get a different plain text than PT. Why? It's that principle we just saw, that is, uh, which one? We have two different ciphertext values. We have CT and CR. If they were encrypted with the same key, it must be two different plain text values. So P2 and a uh, PR and PT must be different. And again, we assume that we can recognize that one of them is wrong. PT is a uh, PR is incorrect. This provides a service of data integrity. Integrity says that if someone does modify a message along the way, we can detect that. And we detect it because B recognizes that the received plain text is incorrect. The first case provided confidentiality. No one could see the plain text because they don't have the key and they cannot decrypt. No one other than A or B. One other service, authentication. How does B know the message came from A? Are they sure it came from A? Let's consider a case where a malicious user tries to pretend to be A and we'll see what happens. We'll start again. B is going to receive a message. And they're going to receive not from A, but what is actually from the malicious user. B receives a message and the message says it's from A. B thinks the received ciphertext is from A. What does B do? When B receives ciphertext from A, what does it do? Try to decrypt. Good. It tries to decrypt that ciphertext. What key does it use? It thinks it's from A. What key will B use to decrypt? The key it's shared with A. We denote as KAB. Same as before. So B receives a message. Ah, this is from A. Let's decrypt it. Ciphertext CR. Decrypt We're using KAB, the key shared between A and B. We get some plain text. Denote as PR. Now let's go back about the message that the malicious user created. The, the malicious user wanted to pretend to be A. So they created a message, they took some plain text, uh, let's denote PT, and they encrypted that plain text to get.
They took a plain text, maybe the fake message they wanted to send to tell B to do something that they shouldn't do, and they encrypted that plain text with what key? What key could the malicious user encrypt that plain text with? Or maybe an easier question is, which key can they not encrypt with? KAB. K -A -B. Okay, they can use any key. Right? So the malicious user just, they started this. They have a plain text, maybe some fake message they want to send to B and make B think it came from A. They encrypt that with a key. But make, it's clear that we assume that the malicious user could not use KAB because we assume that they don't know that se secret key. So we'll denote it as just KM from the malicious user. So they use any other key, but it's not the same as KAB because they don't know what that value is and they cannot guess it because it's too large. There's too many bits, such that there's so many possibilities they cannot guess it. So, what happens at B? What does B realize when it tries to decrypt? It gets the wrong plaintext. PR is incorrect. Why? Because again, the ciphertext, in this case, uh, the transmitted ciphertext and the received ciphertext are the same. That is, what malicious user generated here is the same what B receives here. So let's look at CT was created by encrypting, actually we'll just denote it as C, was obtained by encrypting using KM of some plain text PT and then what B does is tries to decrypt C using a different key. And our assumption is that when we try to decrypt using the different key, we will get recognizably wrong plaintext. If we use the wrong key, we will not get the same plaintext and it will be recognizably wrong. That is a random sequence and we can't identify any structure. So th when B decrypts, they, they get some plain text. They recognize this is not the correct plain text, and that implies that something's gone wrong. Don't trust this message that I received. And it's the way for authenticating who sent the message. P is incorrect. Don't trust it. Don't trust the received ciphertext. And that was the same with data integrity. If we receive a ciphertext and we decrypt and we get recognizably wrong plain text, don't trust it. Discard it. Uh, it's considered insecure. If it's recognizably correct plain text, trust it. It's assumed correct. And so this really detects. Uh, an attack. If the malicious user tries to send a fake message, they don't know KAB. It will only work if the malicious user knows KAB and our assumption is that they don't know KAB because it's a shared secret between only A and B. If the malicious user knows it, then it's no longer a secret. So this is authentication. B knows that the message comes from A in the previous case, and in this case it knows it doesn't come from A. When it successfully decrypts, in the first case, if it successfully decrypts with a key KAB, then it implies that it must have been encrypted with a key KAB. And if something was encrypted with a key KAB, who encrypted it? A or, or B. Okay. Who has a key KAB? A and B. 
So if I'm B and I decrypt a message and it successfully decrypts with KAB, then it must have been encrypted with either by either A or B. Well, I am B and I know I didn't encrypt it, encrypt it so it must have been A that encrypted it. So that is authentication. We know that this message came from A if it successfully decrypts. Similar, if it doesn't successfully decrypt, we don't trust it. It could have come from someone pretending to be A. So that's authentication. And similar, we have integrity. If it, again, if it doesn't successfully decrypt, don't trust that message. Maybe it's been modified along the way or it's come from the wrong user. So either case, don't trust it. If it does successfully decrypt, trust it and it's a proof that it does come from A and that it hasn't been modified. Because if it was modified, it wouldn't successfully decrypt. And if it didn't come from A, it wouldn't successfully decrypt. So symmetric key encryption really provides three services at once. Confidentiality, no one can find the plain text. Integrity, if the message is modified, we will know. And authentication, if it comes from someone who's not A, we will know. So we can authenticate the source. Confidentiality, no one can find P. In the, case that it, in the case that it successfully decrypts, okay, we decrypt the message successfully, then we know that that message is confidential. No one else knows P. To know P, you must know the key. And again, we assume no one else knows the key. Confidentiality, integrity. If it successfully decrypts, then it implies that the message hasn't been modified. Or, if, it de if it's unsuccessful in decryption, then it implies that the message may have been modified or come from the wrong person. As we saw in this case, if the ciphertext was modified, the plain text would be incorrect, and we'd recognize that. And authentication, if it successfully decrypts, then it implies that A is the person who encrypted the message, which means the message came from A, not someone else. Important concepts because they're used in, in a number of security mechanisms in IT security. Any questions before we look at an alternative approach for authentication? And all of this, these assumptions are again listed on several of those slides and there's one handout with two pages which captures all of these assumptions together. We've jumped through slides, but the one that we really just went through was this. And it's a simplified version. So we're looking now not just at confidentiality, but authentication. The receiver wants to verify that the contents of the message have not been modified. Data authentication, or what we've just called data integrity. The data has not changed. And that the source is who they claim to be, source authentication. So they go together really. Integrity and authentication often come together. There are different ways to do it. We've just seen using symmetric key encryption. But there are in fact other approaches to provide the same services. We'll go through some of them. What we saw was that we tried to go through the case where if we use symmetric key encryption that is, we have a message, here it's M, not P, and we encrypt with a key, shared secret key, K, we send the ciphertext. If it successfully decrypts, we're saying that it must have came from A, because only A has the key to encrypt, and it must not have been modified, because if it was modified, it wouldn't successfully decrypt. So symmetric key encryption provides confidentiality, Authentication of the data or integrity of the data and authentication of the source, making sure we know who sent the message. 
And this always based upon the assumption that if we decrypt with the wrong key or modified ciphertext, we'll produce output that will not make sense and we'll be able to recognize that. So symmetric key encryption can be used for all three. It turns out in many cases for practical reasons that we'd like to keep confidentiality separate from authentication. Maybe we'd like to use different software or perform those operations at different time when we're sending messages. So although symmetric key encryption does provide authentication, Often we want to use other techniques for providing authentication because symmetric key encryption, uh, we don't want to have to rely on it. Sometimes the algorithms for symmetric key encryption are slower than our other techniques. So there are other techniques for doing the same thing. One of them is called a message authentication code, a MAC. It's effectively the same as symmetric key encryption but there are different algorithms for doing it. We're not going to look at it just be aware if you see a, a message authentication code, not medium access control that you may be studying in other courses. MAC in this case means a way to authenticate messages. And it uses almost the same techniques as symmetric key encryption. There are some details on those slides of how it works, but I think we will not see any further examples. We may just hear the word a MAC. If you hear this protocol uses a message authentication code, then recognizes, ah, it provides some form of authentication of the data and the source. We want to get to another example. Some names of the MACs, there are different specific algorithms. In the same way for encryption, there's DES, AES, and others. There are different MAC algorithms. OMAC, PMAC, CMAC, UMAC, VMAC, HMAC, and others. Okay? Again, you don't need to remember them. The one that you may see in practice a little bit more is HMAC. It's actually based upon hash functions, which we're going to look at next. But there are different MAC algorithms used in practice. Let's look at or let's, instead of going through MAC algorithms, just summarize on the assumptions we'll make about authentication so far. If we receive ciphertext and it successfully decrypts with a key KAB, then we know that the original message hasn't been modified, there's been no modification, and that it came from one of the owners of that key. And there are two people who know that key in the world, A and B. And if I'm, if I'm B and I receive the message that successfully decrypts, then it must have come from A unless I sent it to myself. So we'll use that as an assumption th through the rest of the course. And if we hear about a MAC, then we assume that if we use a MAC and we talk about not decrypting MACs but verifying MACs, verify the authentication. If the MAC is successful, then we know the message has not been modified and again the MAC has a secret key. One of the owners of that key, it, that message must have come from. So in fact a MAC, we can, it's almost the identical assumption. If we use symmetric key encryption or a MAC, we can prove the message came from a particular user and that it didn't get modified along the way. Let's look at another way for authentication and, and to look at this because it's it uses hash functions and in fact hash functions become important for another security service of a digital signature. So we'll spend a bit of time on them. Everyone studied hash functions? Which course did you study hash functions? Hands down, I assume yes in this class. Okay, if you don't put your hand up when I ask a question, I'll assume you're just lazy, you just mean yes. Where did you study hash functions? I'm sure you probably did somewhere. Some, some lab, computer lab. Maybe some data structures course, possibly. I think maybe a data structures course. Hash functions are used in computer science for 
what do they do? We take some input and it maps that input to usually some unique value. Okay, we take the hash of some input and we get some unique value as output, or almost unique. So we'll say a little bit about hash functions and, and then talk about cryptographic hash functions, which are really the same but have a, a few different properties um, because they're important with different aspects of security. So what is a hash function H? Some function that takes a variable length block of data M, so the input is some message M, and the message usually can be different lengths. It could be 100 bits, it could be 100 gigabytes. So most hash functions will take variable length inputs. And what it does is it's a function that takes that input and produces a fixed size hash value lowercase h as output. That's called the hash value. It's a bit confusing. Uppercase h is the function, lowercase h is the hash value, the output. And the output usually has some properties or desirable pro properties, and especially with uh, cryptography. Some things that we expect of the hash function is that if we apply it on different inputs, different values of M, then the hash values that come out should be random looking, appear random, and should be evenly distributed about the space. So that I take the hash value of one message and the output I think is a random value and I take a hash value of another message which is almost the same as the first. Okay, maybe differs by one bit. Then the hash value that comes out should be significantly different and again random compared to the first hash values. They shouldn't be similar. And we'll see some examples of that. Basically produce random outputs. That's what we'd expect. There are some limitations. What are some examples of hash functions? Some names of hash functions. MD5. You may have heard of MD5. Uh, it's used in uh, security, but uh, or different different aspects of computer security. Sometimes when you download a file from a file server, uh, if you want to be sure that the file that you've downloaded matches the original, there may be some hash value or MD5 checksum attached, or, or as a separate entity that you can download and verify. So we'll see the role of that. MD5 is one hash function. There are many hash functions. The two ones that we come across a lot in security is MD5 and SHA, S-H-A, the secure hash function. We'll see in the later slides it lists the names of them. Okay. Uh, MD5 and SHA, secure hash algorithm. Sorry. Let's just have a quick example. Uh, I have some plain text files. One's from yesterday. Let's just have a look. Plain text. Here's our super secret message. Here's our message M. And let's apply a hash function on it. Zoom in a bit. We have our message. And I have the MD5 hash function. The, the software on my computer is called MD5 sum. All it does is takes the message as input, not the file name, but the contents of the file. So this program takes, hello, this is our super secret message, keep it secret, goodbye, sorry we've run out of space, and calculates the hash of that using the algorithm called MD5. You already know, but be careful, we're not necessarily talking about confidentiality. Okay, we'll see that hash functions are not used to provide confidentiality. We care about authentication at the moment. And we'll see hash functions are used for that. But let's just see it work. There it is. There's the hash value. In hexadecimal, you can convert it to binary if you like. How long is it? How many bits? 
can't you see? Well, on the slide it says that how, how many bits MD5 is. It's 128 bit hash value. Okay. A 32 hex characters. Okay. So this is the hash value of this file. That's all. So MD5 takes any length input and always produces a 128 bit output. And it should be random. Okay, I say random looking, but uh, we think in general random. I've got another plain text, plain text 2. And let's take the hash of that. What are we going to get? What value are we going to get? Again? Something very different. Two different hash values come out. This is 3FAA, so on. The first one was 91DD, D2, and so on. Why are they different? Mm. Right, same hash function, two different hash values come out. What can we say about the plaintext? What conclusions can we make about the two different, or the two plaintext values, plaintext.txt and plaintext2.txt? What can we Im imply? If the hash values are different, then the messages are different. Okay. And I'll, it's hard to see, it wraps around, but if we zoom out a bit, I'll try it again. Plain text 1, plain text 2. Are they different? Where are they different? The dot. The dot. Okay, it's just all the characters are the same except at the end I replace the dot, the final full stop, with a space. Okay, so I just changed. In fact, in the binary form, just a, it's just a few bits. I think four bits have changed, or a, a few bits have changed. So the messages are almost the same, but they are different, but very similar. And again, we take the MD5 sum of each of them. And we get two completely different hash values. So that's the property we expect of hash functions. Two different inputs always give two different outputs. That's our expectation. And the, way, the other way we can look at that, if we get two different outputs, two different hash values, that implies the inputs were different. And the property is that the hash value should be random. So therefore, even if two messages are very similar, in this case they differ just by a few bits, the hash values will be significantly different. So random in this case. They will not be similar. And different size messages. In this case they were the same size but we could apply it on much longer messages and again we'd get a fixed size 128 bit hash value. If we apply the hash function on two messages which are the same, the hash value will be the same that it will always get the same hash value for that same input message. Now, how long is our input message? All right. Both of them were 72 bytes. Okay. 72 bytes, uh, what's that? 576 bits. Okay, so our input messages were both 576 bits in length. The hash values were 128 bits in length. So we've said if we take two different inputs, we'll get two different hash values. Okay, two inputs will produce two different outputs. Is that always true? Mm. Well, correct. And in fact, in this simple example, there's more than 128 bits. So I said that our requirement or our desired property of a hash function was that two different input messages 
will produce two different hash values. But we have a problem. Since the hash function can take any length input, and the length of the input is larger normally than the hash value, then it is possible for two different inputs to produce the same hash value. It must be. And I think that's your issue. Uh, let's explain that, just to make it clear. Our hash function. Let's, let's say m, in our case, was uh, m1. The length, in our example, was 576 bits. And m2 was the same length. But we could use other length uh, messages, but these were our examples. They were our two different plain text messages. They were different. And we produced hash values. H1 is the hash, using MD5 we used, of M1. And that was 128 bits. And hash 2, that's hash, is the hash of M2, also 128 bits. We said two different inputs produce two different outputs. But it's not technically true. That is, there could be two different inputs that produce the same output. And the reason is, and it's, uh, that's true if the length of the input is larger than the length of the output. How many possible messages are there? If we f limit our message size to just 576 bits, all messages are 576 bits, how many are there in theory? No, not infinite. How many messages? If, if every message we take as input is fixed at 576 bits, how many are there? Two to the power of 576. Okay, we're just a binary message. We've got 576 bits, so the number of possible inputs. possible inputs, that is the possible values of m, or denote mi, is 2 to the power of 576 in this example, if we limit the length. How many possible outputs of our hash function, the hi? Well, every hash value is fixed at 128 bits, so 2 to the power of 128. Which one's bigger? The number of inputs, the number of outputs? The number of inputs. That is, we have more inputs than outputs. It must mean, I, I cannot draw them all, but let's see if we looked at all the inputs, there were all the inputs here, if I dot for every possible input, and the number of outputs, there are fewer. It must mean some inputs map to the same output. A hash function is just a mapping function. It maps the input to an output. And because we have more inputs possible than outputs, it must imply that some in inputs return the same output. So we have a uh, conflicting statement here that we'd like our hash function to produce a different output for every input. but when the length of the input can be larger than the length of the output, it must be so that some inputs produce the same output. When two inputs return the same hash value, the same output, it's called a collision. The, the hash, hashing uh, produces a, a collision on the output. So in theory, yes, we will have collisions. But in practice, of these 2 to the power of 576 messages, that's in theory, how many of them are actually English sentences when we combine words? Not many. So in practice, if we have the hash value large enough, even though it's in theory possible to produce 
collisions. In practice, with the messages we use, finding collisions is very hard. It's very, very unlikely to have collisions. So theoretically possible, practically unlikely. And that's what's used in hash algorithms in, in security. So it's a little bit of a, a conflict there, but in practice it's not a problem because it's very, very unlikely to find two different messages that produce the same hash value. It depends upon the hash algorithm as well. Coming back to our slides. So, we talk about a cryptographic hash function. Even though it may be in theory possible to have collisions, we say that for a hash function used in cryptography, we'd like it such that it's practically impossible, I say here, computationally infeasible, meaning trying to find messages that produce collisions would take too long. Computationally infeasible that we have these two properties. Let's look at property two, what we just addressed. If we have two different messages, M1 and M2, in theory it's possible for two messages to produce the same hash value, but we assume that at, with a cryptographic hash function it will take too long for someone to find two messages that produce the same hash value H. This is called the collision-free property. That is, we don't get collisions. So, To summarize that, in theory, it's possible for collisions. A cryptographic hash function is one such that, even though it's possible, to find two messages that produce a collision will take too long. Okay? Because, in fact, it will become uh, the, the challenge for the attacker. Find two messages that produce a collision. In theory, possible. In practice, similar to brute force attacks, takes too long to do that. Another property of hash functions is that they should be a one-way function. A one-way function means that given the message, it's easy to calculate the hash value. We did that on my computer. I calculated the hash of these messages. It does it almost instantaneously. So it's very quick to take the input message and calculate the hash value. But if I give you the hash value, find me the message. Okay, so I give you just this value, 9, 1, D, 2, and so on. Find me what the original message was. That should be practically impossible. That's called the one-way property. That is, it's computationally infeasible to, for someone to find a message that maps to a known hash value. So if I give you H and ask you to find M, it will take you all the time in the universe to do so. Okay, that's that's what we mean by this property. And again, hash functions are designed to satisfy these properties. And we will assume that they do as, as we go through uh, the security mechanisms. So to summarize, a hash function takes a variable length input, produces a fixed size output, it's easy to calculate. Okay? Software can do it quickly. But it's hard to go backwards. It's hard to do the inverse of take the hash value and find M. That's called the one-way property. In practice, the hash function will produce random outputs, different messages, different outputs. And that to find two messages that produce the same hash value is practically impossible. I give you a challenge, your homework for this weekend. Go find another message which is different than mine. Sorry. It's different than this message but produces the hash value 91D2, so that. Okay, that's the challenge of this collision free property. Okay. So, secure hash functions, we assume that that property holds and that you can't find that. It will take you forever to do it. Nowadays MD5 is not considered secure. 
So in fact, there are messages that do produce the same hash value, and people have found them. But SHA, in different forms, is considered secure in that if we take the SHA sum of a message, you will not be able to find another message. So SHA 512 produces a 512-bit output. I give you this hash value. Go and find another message that produces the same hash value. You will not. Okay? That's the collision-free property. What we'll see next week is how do we use hash functions to provide security mechanisms, especially authentication, and then eventually they'll become very important in digital signatures. So we'll continue that next week.